Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 13, titled, The Fight for the Truth, Part 2. Hello, good morning, and welcome to Island Baptist Church. We do some praising, and then we do some studying. That's what we're here to do. We're not here to present our opinions. We're here to present you with the Word of God as it is. And uh, for us to take or to leave, that is your option, but it's not an option for us as to whether we present the Scriptures. So here we are. We're going to be in John chapter 18. We are working our way through the book of Luke, uh, but we're not going to be in Luke today because we're using it as a jumping off place to talk about a topic called the truth. And we may come back next Sunday and do that again. But truth is an incredibly important topic, and you're going to see why as we make our way through this. Luke chapter, I'm sorry, John chapter 18. And we ended last time by looking at this uh, brief conversation that Jesus had with Pilate, his mock trial, and first uh, taken into custody by the Jews and uh, sentenced to death, but they couldn't carry out capital punishment, so they sent him to Pilate, who was a Roman lackey. Uh, Rome, you know, the, original, the original armed IRS was any Roman government that, that ruled your country. Uh, they only existed for the sake of getting taxes for Rome. They did not care about the people. Uh, they did not care about the welfare of the people, and though they promoted that, but they were only interested in making money, and that's, that's, that's what all his job is. But anyway, he's put on trial there in front of Pilate, and Pilate asked him some interesting questions that I want us to deal with. Verse 37 says, Pilate therefore said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king, for this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world. Notice what he says, to bear witness to the truth. Oh, everyone, here's, here's, talk about a broad statement and talk about an all-encompassing statement. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. That's huge. He says in another place, John 10, my, he, my sheep hear my voice and they will not follow another. That's interesting. That's interesting. How, how secure are we in our faith? So once you've come to Christ, Scripture seems to indicate you're His. I mean, it. You cannot be changed from one sheep to another. You cannot be changed from one fold to another. So what does it also tell us about those who do not listen to Jesus? You take it for the truth, right? Pilate says, everyone who hears me, hears the truth, listens to my voice, hears my voice. Pilate says, what is, what is truth? Such an incredibly important question, not only because of the topic, but also because, like Pilate, most people don't know the answer to that question. What is the truth? What is the truth? We live in a day, of course, we've never lived in any other day in which the truth has always been in question since the very beginning, but today for sure is in question. Everybody claims to like the truth. Would you like the truth to be told to you or would you like a liar to be told to you? Which one? Of course you do. So ladies, do I look fat in this dress? Do you really want the truth? Do you really want the truth? Man, we don't ask those kind of questions. We ask other questions that we don't want the truth from, but nonetheless. We saw last time that we, again, you know, so we say we want the truth, but we, we want the truth primarily when it favors us. And when it disagrees with us, we don't like it. And like, the truth is this. Well, it totally disagrees with the way I live, the way I've been thinking, the way I believe, and the way I've been taught. Well, ooh boy, you're going to have a hard time giving in to the truth. But sometimes that is exactly uh, what happens to us. We saw last time how important the fight for the truth, and it is a fight because our God is a God of truth, but the world doesn't accept him. Uh, just the verses from last time. Deuteronomy 32, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. God, a God of truth. But people don't really want that. They don't want his person of God. They don't want the person of his spirit. The helper is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Notice, not just will not, cannot. Why? Because they don't belong to him. My sheep hear my voice. They will not follow another. Because it does not, they do, it does not see him, the world doesn't, or know him. So why is it a fight for the truth? Because God is a God of truth. The Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And they don't want him. They don't want them. They don't want their, his son, Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth. Notice he doesn't just have the truth. He doesn't just know the truth. He doesn't just speak the truth. It is actually who he is. And thus he can say, uh, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have to come. If you, don't come, if you come through falsehood, you're not coming to the Father, right? Because the Father is the Father of truth. 
He's the God of truth. And the Spirit who speaks through him is the Spirit of truth, and the Son is the truth himself. And so we do not come to God except to come to God through the truth. And ultimately, what do, where do we hear the truth from? Jesus tells us, sanctifying the truth. Your word is truth. See, the determining factor of your life in eternity is to decide whether or not God is telling us the truth in the Scriptures. That decides everything for you. Either he is telling the truth or he is not telling the truth. Either it is truth or it is false. The true false statement, if any part of it is false, it's all false, right? You have to decide. And by the way, whatever decision you're making, you're betting your life on that. So, do you remember yesterday? Sort of. Do you remember tomorrow? Isn't that a weird statement? So, so you have no more control over your existence than that. You're, you, you can't go back to yesterday and change anything. And you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, but you're going to tell me what's going to happen with your all eternity. Wow, I don't know what kind of deluded person people we are, but we are very deluded to think that we know what truth is as opposed to him. Grave danger. You're betting your life, whatever decision you make. You're betting your life on it. The word of God is the truth. And the world is bond, in bondage without it. Jesus reminds us, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And not until then. You're not set free until then. In the way you live, in the way you think, in the way you exist, we're not free. We're not free. So why is it a battle for the truth? Because we, we, I, this is our job. This is our call. The call of the church is to set people free. People uh, can't be saved apart from the truth. Notice. So, so you talk about Jesus and you preach Jesus, but the Jesus you preach isn't the same as the Jesus of the Bible. Can you be saved by that Jesus? No. He doesn't exist. He's a lie. This is a good and acceptable inside of God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. It's got to be the truth. You use the name Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit and you claim to read the Bible or go by the Bible, but actually the things that you disagree with what it says. You're not on the truth. You're not doing the truth. And the church's position with regard to the truth, of course, is the same thing. The household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Why does it have to be a battle for us? Because it is a battle, guys. We don't get, we get to opt out of this battle. It, it, we're in the middle of it. And, and, and to a certain degree, we're the cause of it. So, so the first dilemma we saw last time in the Bible is primarily a dilemma of our lives. Has God told us the truth? This is the the, the, the question that Satan brings to Eve, the first question in the Bible, the first dilemma. Has God really said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Of course, that totally misquotes God in every way. He's just trying to rock her. He's not interested in an answer. He's interested in getting into her head, and he does it very well. He's interested in knocking her back off on her heels and then pushing her all the way over. And, of course, he does actually accomplish that. But he's not interested in the truth. He's all about lies. He's always about denying the things that God has from us. So he raises his question, and he introduces or smuggles in, as we talked about last time, a very deadly spiritual force. Here's what it is. We saw it last time. That you and I have the capacity to evaluate what God has said. That's a total lie. It's a total lie. It, it's, it's, it's a total blanket pulled over our eyes that we have the capacity, that we have the ability. Like I said, you can't change yesterday, and you can't tell me what tomorrow is, but you can tell me what truth is. Wow, do you have a high opinion of what's running around between your ears, don't we? That we can adjust or evaluate the God who created us. Man, talk about arrogance. We are loaded to the gills with arrogance it's smuggled in right here in the garden of eden smuggled in this deadly spiritual force that we can evaluate what god has set in fact it's not that way it's the other way here we saw again this last time hebrew 4 12 where the word of god is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword you and i aren't that sharp you can't even do anything about yesterday you can't tell me what's going to happen tomorrow you ain't too sharp you just not the word of god is very sharp, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So we think we can sit in judgment upon what God has said, when in fact it's the exact opposite. 
We're being judged. In fact, that word judge there in the Greek language, the Old Testament was translated in the Greek about 200 years before Jesus, and it's something called the Septuagint. So we have the entire Old and New Testament in Greek, Koine Greek form. That one word in the Greek shows up nowhere in Old or New Testament. Only here. It is a unique word. So the Holy Spirit, who is the crafter of the Scriptures, crafts these words to the writer of the Hebrews and picks a single word that wasn't used in 66 big books, 40-something different authors written over 2,000 years. Wow. Talk about making a point. What is the point? It's a special, unique judgment that the Word of God has. And that judgment is powerful. You and I cannot even come anywhere close to it, even though we would like to think that we can So the first dilemma, of course, is this questioning of what God has said, and then he pushes for a full denial. We saw this last time. The servant said to the woman, you certainly will not die. Notice what he's asking her to do. Better life that God isn't right. That's that's what you and I face. You have one shot at this. You're not getting a second round. You're You're betting your life on something. Either God is right or Satan is. You have to decide. She found out very horribly so, and her husband, that uh, God definitely was right. Satan was a liar. But the world has bought the lie, and they follow the liar. Notice it says here, you are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. He got Adam and Eve to kill themselves because they bet against God. That we won't die if we eat of this apple, whatever it was. We won't die. Oh, they certainly did spiritually right when it happened and physically not long after that they did in fact die they bet their life that god was wrong and and well they were wrong we always are we bet against god murder from the beginning does not stand the truth because there is no truth in him whenever he tells a lie he speaks his own nature because he is a liar and the father lies why would we ever follow a guy like that because we're like him we like the lies too Don't tell me I'm fat in this dress, right? Don't tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm right. Tell me what I'm thinking and believing the way I've lived and committed my life to is completely correct. Because that's what I that's what I want to hear. It's the way we are. We really are. It is deadly. So so a lie gets to the ultimate end. The ultimate lie is that we get to be God, and this is what he sells to Adam and Eve. And the reason why they eat the fruit, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will become like God. They already were in the image of God. They were perfect. They were wholesome. They were correct. Everything was right. There was no sin. There was no sickness. There was no... They already were. It's a total lie. Knowing good, you're going to be to be like God. So not only do we get to call, evaluate the God, what God has said, we get to come up with our own ideas about what is correct. And thus, here's the the situation, here's the circumstances of the human race, here's where we've gone. The lie is that we get to be God. We get no rules except the ones we want to keep, no rule, no consequences, no answering to anyone. We become the arbiter of what will and will not be true for us. You can do that. Not recommended. You can do that, but you cannot do that without consequences. Here's the consequences of those who followed the lie. Romans chapter 1, 21 and 22. For even though they knew God, it's a natural thing to know God. We're born that way. You're born with a system that knows that there is a God. Even though they knew that, they didn't go with that. Instead, they denied that. They did not honor him as God or give thanks. So this is what actually happens. The consequences of everything else. So the consequences, by the way, later on in Romans talks about homosexuality, talks about depraved minds and all this stuff. Guys, those are consequences. Those are not causes. The cause, I mean, they don't help things, but the cause is not honoring God and giving thanks to Him. It's denying that, that, that God-giving ability of knowing that there actually is a God. We know that. We deny it. Notice the results. They become futile, became futile in their reasonings, and their senseless heart was darkened, claiming to be wise, right? I'm smart. I know what truth is. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's what happens. Consequences. One of the consequences is this uh, worshiping of false. You hear this all the time in the scriptures, worshiping these false 
these idols. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. How dumb is that? Or birds or four-footed animals or crawling creatures. When we sit back and say, how could you? So you just cut it down yesterday. You shaped it with a chisel. You poured some hot metal over it so that it would, it would take on at least looking like solid silver or gold or whatever, and you faced, put a face on it, and now today you're throwing yourself down in front of it? How could you be so dumb, right? Well, we're capable of being really dumb, apart from God and apart from the intervention of His truth. But, but make, 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 make no mistake about it. Uh, creating an idol is not religion. Actually, the religion has always been the same. You get to worship yourself. Say, I get to be God. No human being would ever give up the right, once they become God, to let anybody else become God. So, so they make an idol, and they bow down to it, but let's remind ourselves, they made it. So it gets to be what they want. I get to do what I want. I get, he, gets to, he has my rules. He has my precociousness. He has my uh, hate. He has my anger. He likes people I like and hates people that I hate and does what I want to do and goes where I want to go. And that's the way I want God to be because I, well, ultimately, I'm God. So now I call the shots. So I'm obviously not going to make an idol that disagrees with what I believe already, right? doesn't make any sense. And we put a veneer on it, you know, silver or gold. And we put a veneer of religiosity, carries some degree of piety, some degree of morality. But in fact, it's just us being God, calling the shots. And the others say, oh, that was, how dumb. Why would you bow down to a block of wood, right? And so they create religions that do the same thing. No idol to bow down to. Instead, the idol becomes the things in their hearts. They, they carry a Bible with them, but it's selective. Oh, we don't believe those things. Well, these parts are true, and these parts aren't true. And these parts we agree with, and these parts we're not too sure if they were actually said. And there was a big conference back in the uh, mid-2000s. It's called the Jesus Conference, where they, they called on evangelical, quote-unquote, whatever you want to call it, whatever that means. But it doesn't mean anything to me, especially with regards to these guys and gals. Thousands upon thousands of church leaders came together to decide what part of the New Testament was actually true and what part wasn't. They, by the way, they eliminated the whole book of John, the entire book. They kept very few of the red letters of what Jesus says because, because Jesus wouldn't say those things, don't you know? We voted. We're all smart, even though we can't remember tomorrow and we can't fix yesterday. We're smart. Wow. So they create a veneer of religiosity, carrying a Bible all the time. But just because, as we said before, you have a Bible doesn't mean you have the truth. Hear me on that. You do not have the Bible, you do not have Scripture until you have it correctly interpreted. And you need to go not very far into the world to find plenty of people with the Bible who are not walking or living by the truth, even though they're claiming to be, even though they hold up to be, but they do not. Remember this guy? Remember that guy? You're going to have to remember him because he is dead, along with all of his fathers. Name, name was Marshall Applewhite. You may remember him. They were the pajama-wearing, tennis shoe-clad followers of Jesus, according to what they thought the Bible said. And he had them all in a big room, and they all committed mass suicide as hale Bop Comet passed by, believing they could get in a spaceship in the tail of that comet. They supposedly got it from the Bible. It, it'd be funny if it wasn't sad. Hey, by the way... <laughs> Not a hypocrite, is he? What's a hypocrite? Well, he's the Joseph Smith who creates Mormonism, who tells them not to smoke and not to drink coffee while he's writing the book, smoking and drinking coffee. That's a hypocrite. He's just a liar, a total liar. Applewhite's not a liar. Or I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. Not a hypocrite. He died with them. Not a hypocrite. They bet their lives that this guy was right. They bet their lives. This guy, remember this one? This is closer to home. Our fellow Texan, or was. Again, you're going to have to remember him, too. David Koresh, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Waco up there, with Bibles in their hands, believing that he was the reincarnation of Jesus. They bet their lives, they literally did, that he was telling the truth and that the Bible was not. You can do that. You really can, or these guys, some of the nicest guys I know, look like that. Mormons. 
carry a Bible with him. Now, he's not in this picture. He's carrying the Book of Mormon, but they carry a King James Version of the Bible. Anybody got a King James? I love that version. Absolutely love it. I've been reading through this year. Very good interpretation, English interpretation of the Scriptures. Excellent. I absolutely love it. They carry it with them. In that Bible that they carry, it tells us that Jesus is God, that, that uh, faith alone in Christ alone is the only way to come to God, and yet they have a religion, even though carrying this Bible, that denies both of those things. You can do that. Just because you have a Bible doesn't mean you have the truth. It has to be correctly interpreted. There are definitely ways to get it incorrect. That's why Paul tells Timothy, be diligent. Present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Accurately handling the word of truth. You don't come at it with, I already have my ideas, and I'm going to find out what the Scripture has to say that proves what I think. I come out and saying, this is the word of God. Whatever it says is what it says. If it dissects the things that I thought, if it destroys and dismantles the things that I was going to do, or the way I was thinking, the way I was living, or the way I was believing, or the way my mama taught me, it needs to be okay. That's the way we deal, if it's the word from God, if it's the truth. So, so it has to be correctly handled. Not, that's what it says, but what God actually meant was this. You hear a lot of that. That's what it says, but God didn't mean, or that's not what God actually said. So we now get to decide what God said. Wow. So and I've said this before, so you write a letter to us, introduce yourself here to this congregation. We've never met you, never seen you. In the letter, you tell the truth. What your name is, where you're from, what you do, who you're married to, how many kids you have, what your heart and passions are, all this stuff. And describe yourself. And so we read, the, we read the letter in front of the congregation. What she said was thus and such, but we don't think that's true. What she really meant was, that's not her real heart. Her real heart is these things. So you just wrote an honest letter and you just introduced it yourself. How does that make you feel? See, God's done that for us. And we're redacting it. We're controlling it. We're changing it. Now, there is a way, definitely a way, to get it wrong. That's why Paul tells not only to get it right, rightly divided, he also tells to stick with that. I solemnly exhort you. Notice the, how, how incredibly uh, serious and sincere Paul is at challenging. So Paul's writing to, to Timothy. He's writing his last letter, by the way. Second Timothy is his swan song. That's it. Poof, he's gone. He gets beheaded not long after this. He's writing to his young protege who's been pastor over uh, the Ephesus church for probably a number of years by this time. He writes to him to remind him of what actually he needs to be doing. I'm leaving this life. I want to make sure, make sure and punch my ticket before I punch my ticket. I want to make sure that you have it real clear what you're supposed to do. I solemnly exhort you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Wow. He could have just said, I solemnly charge you. I think that would have been enough. But man, he's got to come down with the everything Jesus is and everything he might do if you don't do what he tells you to do kind of thing. Well, that's what he does. Notice, I, I solemnly exhort you, preach the word, not your opinion of the word, not somebody else's word, not something you've added to the word, not a commentary to the word. Don't redact it. Don't change it. Don't fix it. Don't make it say what's comfortable. Don't run a political uh, campaign, I'll tell you what you want to hear kind of thing. No, just preach the word. Let it be what it is. Be ready in season, out of season. Correct, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. That is what you're supposed to do, nothing else. Don't say it doesn't say what it clearly does say. Don't say it says what it clearly does not say. Let it be what it is. It is the truth. It is God's truth inspired by him it tells us just in the previous chapter breathe literally by god it says and because here's what's here's what's also true stick to that he says do nothing else let nothing else be your program let nothing else be your purpose let nothing else be what you do because here's what's going to happen it's a huge temptation to go the other direction if it means a lot more to you that you be pleasing to people than you are to god here's what's the temptation for the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. So I do, do I look fat in this dress, but don't tell me the truth. Tell me that, you know, the emperor still has his clothes on, right? 
But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desire. So they already have a desire, already have a conclusion. And they're looking for people who will agree with their conclusion. You can do that. But you won't come to the truth that way. You can do that. There are people out there who will, who will be yes to you, absolutely. Of course, they're going to want your money, and they're going to want other things. But, 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 but yeah, they'll agree with you. They'll go along with what you want to say. They have absolutely no scruples, no morals. They have no commitment to the truth whatsoever. And if you don't either, well, they're not happy to help you with that. They can oblige that direction. They, they, they hate it. Don't, don't tell me I'm fat in this dress. Feed me lies, right? They, they hate what the light of the truth tells them. How do we, what, what, is good, what good is light? It tells us the truth. I told the kids last Sunday, the best way to keep your room a mess, don't let your mom turn on the light. Don't recommend that, kids. She's going to find a way to turn the light on. Keep it in the dark. In the dark, we can all say we're 10 feet tall. We have purple skin and, I don't know, all of our hair and all that stuff. Yeah, but when you turn the lights on, what do you get? The truth. That's what Jesus says. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. Jesus came in and flipped on the lights because he is the light. People loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. That's why they killed him. They didn't like the light, because they liked to stay with their falsehood. Everyone, he says, for everyone who does, not, who does evil hates the light, does not come to the light, so that his deeds will not be exposed. Don't turn on the light, because you're going to see that I've been lying. Don't turn on the light, because you're going to see that I've been living according to a lie. They don't like the truth. They don't like the light. I can be skinny and 120 in the dark, right? Turn on the light. Sorry, ma'am, not so much. Because why? Here's the ultimate end. They will turn their ears away from the truth. Notice the other option you have. And it, it is an option. It is your prerogative. The sovereign God does give you a choice. You will, they will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myth. There's not but one or the other. It's not like there's, you know, there's the A level of truth and there's the B level of truth and the C level of truth. It's only truth, one, and only myth, two. That's your options. That's just the options. There aren't anything else. That, that cement wall over here behind me is it's, it's made out of cement. It's stood there since 1985. The truth is, you cannot run through it. Now, you're welcome to challenge me on that. And I can tell you how. And I would say, as long as I get to watch, call the ambulance. The truth is, though, is that thing's made out of about a half a foot of cement. It's been staying there since 1985 against hurricanes and tropical storms and other things. And you, being a physical human being, cannot run through that wall. That is the truth. There's not an alternate to that truth. Now, you can be deluded and think that there is an alternate. Like if I run really fast, or if I get really skinny, man, I kind of push in between the molecules, you know, of the, I don't know, of the wall. Or, or, or we can all, here's a better idea, we can all cook the books. We can all get together and vote on a new math. The new math is there's a different principle of physics out there that says somebody like me can run through a wall like that. We can all vote and say it's true. Does it change the truth, though? Not at all. Not at all. See, so the world, ladies and gentlemen, is headed to a wall. And they've convinced themselves that they can run through that wall. They can't. they convince themselves the wall isn't there, but it is. They convince themselves that, that something's going to be different. That the wall of eternity is coming, and they're going to splat up against it. It's coming. It's the truth. There's not but one of those. But they've lied to themselves about what that wall is, and they've lied to themselves about who they are. Oh, I can just change and run faster. I can change my hair. I can change my skin. I can educate myself. So now I'm an educated person who tries to run through that wall. The education wasn't very good. Every time the Word of God is questions, that is Satan having a Garden of Eden conversation with us. Did God really say that? Can God really be trusted? to tell you the truth. So you don't have, you and I don't have an option. We're, we're at the mercy of entities that are far greater than us. Satan, definitely. God, infinitely so. 
We're at the mercy. So we have to decide in, in our humble, small state, who's telling us the truth? What is the truth? Am I going to trust the lie that I'm being told that I'm great and that I'm awesome and that I can trust myself and that I'm God and I decide what the truth is and what the consequences are? Or am I going to really own up to the reality of, oh, that can't be true? It can't be. Every time we hear the Word of God contradicted, like there are errors, or Jesus didn't really do those miracles, or Jesus isn't actually God, or there are other books or writings that we have to add to the Scriptures in order to correctly interpret them. All these are, are nothing more than Garden of Eden conversations with the devil. Same conversation he had with Adam and Eve. Did God really say that? Are you going to believe me? Are you going to believe him? See, it's a fight for the truth. And the subject of the truth of that fight, of that war, is us. I want to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me. We pray together. Where are you with the, with the truth? Where do you stand? Do you really want to hear it? But I'll say, tell me the truth. Really? Do you really, really want the truth? Jesus says, if you want the truth, you come to him. Because he's the only one that speaks the truth. He is the truth. He is the only way to God. The way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. It's the spirit of truth that draws us to the word of truth. That gives us the information so that by the hearing of the word, we can have faith. God, I thank you that you work in our lives just like that, drawing us to yourself. Many are called, but few are chosen. The ones that hear your voice, they're the ones. They're the ones who know you. Lord, I pray that we would hear you. I pray that our hearts will be turned over within us in repentance. Thank you, God, for speaking to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.